Hi, I'm Harry Reeder, Senior Pastor at Briarwood Presbyterian Church. Well, this is another edition of Conversations with Harry and Bruce, our, supplement, our supplementary and substitutionary podcast that we're doing until we can again reassemble on Sunday evening and accommodate the various ministries that also are attached to our Sunday evening worship, such as our choirs and our youth ministries. As most of you know, we've just taken a step forward with our interim worship ministry plan D, and that is now rolling out starting this Sunday, and uh, we'll also, more aspects of it will be rolled out in the coming weeks. But the devotional tonight is uh, John 15, 8. Uh, I, you know, Jesus loved to use parables, but he also used allegories. Uh, parable is an extended simile. A allegory is, um, is, is an extended collection of metaphors. Uh, both of them would be done in a short story form. So you can spot a parable with the words like or as because it is an extended simile in a short story form. But the, uh, but the um, allegories you can spot by the fact of how something is juxtaposed by something else. You know, Jesus is the door. Jesus is the vine. And then this collection and a story is built around it. Uh, the, um, the, the wonderful thing that I love to do is uh, look at the allegories as well as the parables. And John 15 contains one where Jesus is the vine, the Father is the vine dresser. I, know, I don't want to go over all of the verses, uh, but I do want to just cover a summation statement that he makes in John 15, 8. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. That's a great verse. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So he has just done this, uh, this allegory, and as he has um, depicted us, he's the vine, we're the branches, the father is the vine dresser, and the father prunes, and he gives two cases of the pruning of the father in the story. And, but he also gives the reason for pruning. Uh, there are two reasons for pruning. One is to remove those that look like branches, but they're not branches, and they're cast into the fire. That means eternal condemnation. In other words, there are some who would imitate and profess to be in the vineyard of Christ, but they are not because they have no root in him who is the vine. And that's why he tells us, that's why he calls us to abide in him, and he abides in us. What's the result of abiding? That you bear fruit. And then he gives the second reason for pruning, not only to purify the vineyard, but also to purify the branches. In other words, he is growing us. He is perfecting us. And he shows it by making the point that we, when we're in him, we bear fruit. When we abide in him, we bear more fruit. And when we are pruned, we bear much fruit. Recently, I just put on the Facebook, uh, I try to do a little statement periodically of encouragement or insight, and I just did one recently. And I really meant this. Uh, I have come to understand the passage in James where it says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the trying of your faith produces uh, endurance and character, etc. And I've come to understand I am where I am today in Christ, not in spite of the trials of life, but because of the trials of life, as a sovereign grace of God has administered them and as the sovereign grace of God is at work within me in the midst of them and that God is using those. Well, that's what he's talking about. As he prunes, you grow so that not only do you bear fruit. So if you're a believer, you're going to bear. If you don't bear fruit, if there's no fruit, there's no root. But then when you abide in Christ, you bear more fruit. And when he prunes you, you bear much fruit. Now, what is fruit? Well, John 15, 8 tells you. It is a way of life by the grace of God 
that fixes us on Christ, where two things mark us. Number one is that we live our life to the glory of the Father. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. And then that we bear witness not only to the glory of God the Father, by the power of the Spirit of God within us, we bear witness to Christ as our Lord and Savior. By this is my Father glorified. What's the this? That you bear much fruit. And, that, and then he says, and so prove, manifest mm. to be my disciples. You see, when you come to Christ for salvation, you also come to Christ to follow him. You're a disciple. And as a church gives itself to equipping you and discipling you, and you give yourself to discipleship and discipling others, you're going to grow. You're going to bear fruit. You're going to bear more fruit. You're going to bear much fruit. So that's the thought that I would give you today, that God's at work in your life. So in Christ, you're going to bear fruit. Abiding in Christ with intentionality and the means of grace, you're going to bear more fruit. And as the Lord prunes you in this world, you're going to bear much fruit. So, and that will give glory to the Father and will show the world that Christ is your Lord and Savior. There, by the way, there's one key word in there. What does he say? John 15, 8. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Are you one of the you? Are you in Christ? Then you'll bear fruit. Are you in Christ and abiding in Christ? You'll bear more fruit. Are you in Christ and in the trials of life and the pruning of the Lord, will you bear much fruit? The result will be God is glorified in our life. And the result is people will know that we are Christ followers. We prove to be his disciples. Pastor, even as you're unfolding that, and I'm thinking about just the, the times of pruning, uh, which the Lord's had to do a whole lot of pruning. There's probably a more severe word than pruning uh, that he would describe what he does in my life. But I remember when uh, Sonny and I's children uh, were really young, and I caught myself praying to God. Basically, I wanted them to love God more than I do, walk with God more faithfully than I do, uh, have a deeper, intimate love relationship with the Lord more than, uh, more than me, but without any pain, without any trial, without any failure, uh, et cetera, only to conclude, well, that, that's not how God works. And then you do learn to praise the Lord. And now, it's still a, it's still a mitigated prayer. Uh, it's still a, uh, okay, maximum production out of pruning with minimum pruning, uh, which I think my children preferred the first prayer, but that's the way the Lord works in our lives. Yeah, two things. One, I remember one time we had some pruning done that I didn't know about out front, and a couple of the members came up and said, what did, what happened? It's all cut yeah. back. And I said, well, I don't know anything about it, but they tell me it's going to be better. <laughs> Well, sure enough, uh, six months later, everybody looks and says, wow, mm -hmm. uh, pruning really works. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, the other week, uh, Bruce, my youngest daughter, uh, Abigail and Ryan, I'll go ahead and use their names yeah. on this one, uh, they got a sale on mulch, and then they brought the mulch home, and when they got home, they had an email from the Homeowners Association, no one is allowed to use mulch, you have to use <laughs> pine straw. <laughs> so she said, hey, Dad, would you like to buy some yeah. mulch? Well, actually, I did need mulch. Mm. So th they came over. We said, we'll feed you if you'll help us spread it and help us with pruning. So I got Matthias out there, <laughs> and uh, we all went to work and got the pruning. And I remember when it was over, like many other times, and you've done the pruning and the weeding and all the stuff that you need to mm. do so that things will grow. I can't, I, it's unbelievable how much we had to pick up and throw over the side of the hill. Oh, yeah. And... Um, there's a lot of pruning. Yes, there is. <laughs> you know, what, one of the great things to do is just to stop and reflect in your life hmm. every once in a while. How much has God cut away and thrown away? Hmm. And praise God, he's taken, those, he's taken what he's pruned out of my life, and it is gone forever. Amen. Praise his name. Amen. Amen. Well, Pastor, uh, previously you answered a question about sin, the origin uh, of sin uh, contextually. And someone asked a follow-up uh, question, where did evil come from that God could order it, ordering sin, and what does it mean to order sin? 
so I gave the, you know, people were asking, uh, why did God allow evil? Mm -hmm. And I answered it, uh, if I can just give you the shorthand, for his glory. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are attributes of God you would not know without evil. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't know God is patient. You wouldn't know God is gracious. Grace is in opposition to sin. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. You wouldn't know about his mercy. You wouldn't know about his justice. You wouldn't know about any of those mm -hmm. things without the presence. Yet God does not author sin. He is not the origin of sin. So I made the point that God acknowledges in his sovereignty he has ordered the presence of sin, but he did not author it. So the person has come back now, or somebody having heard that said, okay, well, if he didn't author it and it was ordered, who, where did it come from? Mm -hmm. Well, it came from Satan and it came from us. We are the originators mm -hmm. of sin, not God, but God in his sovereign and his sovereign will has ordered its presence and its use. And like everything, God can work all things together for his glory and our good. And that's what he has done for all who have put their trust in him as Lord and Savior. So who, who authored it? Well, it's abundantly clear. God cannot author. He has no desire to sin mm. and no act of sin. Sin has two parts. It has a desire and it has an act. And that's what you see unfolding in, uh, in, um, in eternity as Satan sins. We don't know the timing of it, but we do know he sinned sometime before uh, Adam and Eve sinned because he has been cast down and he comes to Adam in order to tempt him. And so he tempts him to sin and, um, and Eve has already been made. We know that as well. And uh, then Adam, it says, when he's at, at Eve, and then Adam was with her and partake of the fruit, and it says this, when they saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes and desirable to make one, you can see there was attraction mm -hmm. to the temptation on the outside, which Satan brought, that said, God's a liar, I'm telling you the truth, you can be like God. And instead of answering, we already are. Mm. We're made in his image. Right. It was really, we want to be God. There was the attraction. And that ultimately is that all of life is about me. And so that was the attraction. So that comes from within us. And then it came within us. And it had come within Satan, the fallen angel. And, uh, and then also those angels that fell with him that we now call demons uh, by, their, by their fallen term. So uh, that's, uh, that's, that, that's where the authorship of evil and sin comes from. There's also a follow-up question to your, uh, from last week where you made a statement about cremation. And basically the question is one you would hear often, is it wrong, is it a sin to do cremation? No. Oh, I, I tried to make that clear last week. I said, you know, here's what the Bible says, that we are to glorify God and declare the preeminence of Christ in life and death. Mm -hmm. Well, burial is a part of death. Mm -hmm. And so how, do you, how you bury is going to make a statement. Um, and so, but there is no command in, Bible, in the Bible as to how we are to bury. Uh, it doesn't say do it this way. It doesn't give us the liturgy of a burial. But there are multiple examples of of saints being buried uh, and the phrase gathered unto their fathers and so which would mean their body is set aside dust to dust ashes to ashes and then their um, and then their uh, their soul goes to the place of the dead and as we've noted there are two dimensions there is the status of torment, spiritual torment, mm -hmm. and the status of spiritual blessing called paradise or Abraham's bosom. Now, going back to the body, uh, it's just simply ceremonies have made two, two statements. You want the ceremony to make two statements. Number one, we acknowledge that the body is undergoing the curse of sin, dust to dust. It was made from dust, now it's returning to dust. But we also acknowledge that the body was good. There's nothing wrong with the body. When God made the body, like everything else, mm -hmm. he said, it's good. 
And then the second thing is our hope is in Christ who will resurrect this body from the consequences of the curse and give us a new body. And this dust shall be brought back to a new body for the new heavens and the new earth. Thus, the burial is making a statement. It's not positioning the body so God can pull this off. You know, God can bring the body. He's going to bring bodies from everywhere, burned up bodies, um, drowned bodies. Uh, he's going to bring them from everywhere. The Bible says that the grave and the earth and all shall, and the sea shall give up the dead. And when he gives that glorious shout, some will be raised to everlasting, for a body with everlasting condemnation, some to a body for everlasting life. So, um, so, but there's no direct command as to sin is the trend. Here's what remember sin catechism time. Sin is the transgression of or one of conformity unto the law of God, the mm -hmm. commands of God in thought, word, or deed, uh, sins of omission or commission. Uh, so, but there is no command. If there was, I'd say, yes, it's mm -hmm. a sin. But there are precepts, there are examples, and there, are, there is a theological rationale as to why believers have always, with dignity, respect, and ceremony, with the anticipation of the resurrection of the body, have engaged in burial so that whether by life or by death we honor Christ. If you've chosen cremation, uh, that's just my pastoral advice, but I have I've participated in many worship services, any funerals where the body had been right. cremated by believers. If I thought that was sin, I would not have participated. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, so it's not a, it, you know, it's a, that's not a sin. But I would say to believers, here's your rule of life. Just think your way through it. Pray your way through it. And as the Lord gives you peace, follow him. And that is whether by life or by death, so that his body, so that I will not, so that he will not be put to shame. Mm -hmm. I desire that Christ would be honored in everything. Amen. Coming from your uh, sermon about Christ ascended, then the question says, if Christ ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and the Holy Spirit is here on earth as our helper, who is with the souls that are waiting in paradise? Is there scripture that directs us in this? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, we know that they are being comforted by the presence of the Lord. Hmm. Well, but now, Pastor, you just said Jesus has a glorified body and soul and is at the right hand of the Father, having left paradise, the intermediate state in the resurrection, and now ascends to the hmm. Father. And again, remember what he said to Mary. I mentioned it the other Sunday. Don't cling to me. I have not yet ascended to the right. Father. So, but he had already said on the cross, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So what he was saying is, is that his spirit had been in the presence of the Father in paradise. That is that intermediate mm -hmm. state called Hades or shield that we identify the place of blessing as paradise or Abraham's bosom. The place of torment is called the abyss, and uh, and and the word Hades is a general term that refers to the abyss and also to the place of paradise, the place of the dead, the abyss of judgment, the in, the intermediate place of judgment, and then the paradise, the intermediate place of blessing. But the Lord says, the psalmist says, "If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there." So who is there? when you are in that intermediate state, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just like the Father is with you now, and the Son is with you now, by the Holy Spirit. Please remember the triunity that is, Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Mm -hmm. In other words, wherever the Spirit of God is working, so is the second and first person of the Trinity. And so when you are your intermediate state, absent from the body, present with the Lord, the glorified body and the true human body and soul of Jesus that he took upon himself to. And please remember, up until 2,000 years ago, Jesus, God is a spirit, first, second, and third person of the Trinity. The second person now has, by grace for you, has a glorified body and soul. 
but he now comes to you by the Spirit of Christ. People say, well, how can he be with me in paradise if he's at the right hand of the Father? The same way he's with you right now. What does he say? Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then he leaves. And then he leaves. <laughs> the glorified body leaves, but he has Amen. been and is with us by, and that's why Paul likes to call the Holy Spirit's present ministry the presence and power of the Spirit of Christ. Mm -hmm. The same Spirit who was with him, who is identified with him, who is one with him, is at one with you and is at work in your life. Let me give you another example. The Bible says through preaching, Jesus speaks to the heart of his people. Well, how does Jesus at the right hand of the Father speak to the heart of his people? By his spirit, and my sheep know my voice, mm -hmm. and they follow me. Let me give one more dimension to it. The Bible's clear in this intermediate state. There is some way, even though it's a spiritual state, it's not yet a glorified body. That's what he was telling Mary. He had been with the Father in paradise, mm -hmm. but he had not been with the Father in his ascended, right. transformed body and soul at the throne in, in his coronation. That's what he hadn't done yet. But he had been with the Father in paradise, and he and the Father and the Son are with you by the Spirit in paradise, even as they are with you now. Yet then, when they're with you, you will not have the issues of the old man mm -hmm. that you're constantly battling. You don't always feel the presence of the Lord. You don't always sense the presence of the Lord. And the problem is you're in a sin-cursed world with a body that bears the effects of, of sin and with an old man that keeps trying to... But when you go to paradise, you will be unfettered by that. Hmm. Your, your soul will be unfettered by sin, and you will have that presence with the Lord as the Spirit of God is with you. I also believe that it indicates that even though it's a spiritual presence, it's not a non-visible presence that right. you, there was, they were able to see. So I believe you will see the Lord as well as be comforted by the Lord in that intermediate state. But what you don't have is your glorified body yet and that transformed existence of a perfected body and soul. And what you don't have is the final state, which is the new heavens and the new earth. And that's the question. What you just uh, addressed is the question that the, the next person asked. So they said, okay, how do the justified souls experience Christ? And they, they say, are they comforted by him? Do they have communion with him? Do they have fellowship with him in any way larger or somewhat more complete? Than their pilgrimage before death. Yeah, they don't have their sin that hinders their present fellowship with him, mm -hmm. or the old man that's gone. Secondly, they see him. And thirdly, they experience his presence by the Spirit of Christ. When the Spirit of Christ mm -hmm. is with you, Christ is with you. That's why the Bible says he is upon. Uh, that's why the Bible says he dwells in you by faith. Is that as the Spirit of God is within you, Christ is within you upon the throne of your new heart that he has given to you. So that's how you will experience that comfort of his presence. Unfettered by sin, you have his presence now, but you have the issues of the old man with you. You don't have that in paradise. Secondly, you have the anticipation of his coming. That comforts you, so you'll have a resurrected body body and, a, and a, um, a resurrected body and a perfected soul for the new heavens and the new earth. Thirdly, I, I believe you have, I believe you'll hear him. He, you hear him now. Mm -hmm. why, why would you go to paradise and not hear him? Mm -hmm. You will hear him then. He will minister to your soul visually, verbally, and with his presence by his Holy Spirit. All right. Uh, but well, Let me just say, but you don't have the glorified body. Right. And you don't have the perfected that soul united return. to it. And you don't have the new heavens and the new earth yet. And that will be an existence that is both glorified physical and spiritual in that new existence and uh, that where the m mortal puts on immortality and the, um, and the uh, earthly puts on the heavenly for the new heavens and the new earth. And that is the final state. That, final that, state. That, that's the final state, which is uh, several people that I've talked to, they struggled with the term intermediate state. 
and we talked about the final state, okay, are we there yet? No. Well, then there is an intermediate Yeah, state. when people come to me on that, I just say, well, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth? Yes, sir. Do you believe you're going to have a glorified body and a glorified soul? Yes. Well, when you die, where's your body? So there has to be an yeah, intermediate that's right. state. That's what you're being given. It's called the place of the dead, mm -hmm. the souls. And it has two dimensions to it. One is blessing and comfort, and it is glorious. Mm -hmm. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. But it is not final, right. and it is not yet complete. Amen. Um, also, someone asked about the uh, phrase that you used uh, out of Scripture, out of Ephesians 4 that he led captives. Uh, Jesus led captives with him. Um, and they said, could you give a little bit more definition to who are these captives? Yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting question, but um, it was obvious that uh, maybe I had faltered in my preaching, <laughs> uh, which is not unusual, I'm sure. But, uh, but the thing was, when he comes again, is he bringing those captives? Well, the answer is yes. Yeah. But that's not the point of that text. The point of that text is, the king has descended into the battle. He is now ascending back for his coronation and his celebration, mm -hmm. having won the victory over his enemies. And as he ascends, he has the rewards of that victory, and he has the, the enemies that he has captured. That was us. Mm -hmm. We were enemies of God, and he has captivated us. That's why the Bible says when he ascended we ascended. Now, we're still here physically and spiritually in that sense, but legally and positionally because we were in Christ when he died for us and Christ is in us as he redeemed the elect of God from all of their sins on the cross. He came to save his people from their sins. Then positionally and legally, when he ascended, we ascended with him. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, legally, I am now at the right hand of the Father in Christ. I am secured in him with my name in the book of life, and I have everlasting life in Christ and for Christ, for which I will, uh, for which I will be able to glorify the Lord now and forevermore. You know, Pastor, I struggled to, to uh, conclude that we were those captives. And I would read people in the commentaries and other things that would say that we were. And I, it was almost like it was a mental block for me that I just did not, I did not see us as those captives. Finally, what I realized was the reason I didn't see us as the captives was because I didn't see myself as an enemy of God. And so I kept putting myself in the, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm favored. Uh, I, I, I love God. But no, you were an enemy of God, and that's the captives. That's a beautiful passage when, it, when you understand what he's done to us as enemies and now we're the captives that he brings forth yeah you know i was listening to a sermon and it was talking about how jesus loves and died for his friends hmm. well actually jesus loves and lives for his hmm. friends he died for his enemies yeah. to make us Amen. his friends and that's why that ascension sermon is so important at the cross he redeemed his enemies and, and now has captivated us by his grace so that we are in him. And when he ascends, we ascend. We are joint heirs with Christ forever and ever. And he lives to finish his work on us. At the cross, he finished his work to save us from the power and penalty of our sins. Now he is finishing his work on us to eradicate the practice of sin and then he will come again for us and eradicate the presence of sin. We'll conclude with this. This is just not so much a question that got sent in, but um, our continued conversation after we did um, conversations last week, uh, we focused on that sackcloth and ashes, uh, a phrase that you had gotten asked a question about. And you talked about the contextualization of that. But there is an act that is more than simply a contextualization that it that reveals our grief and, and lament in that. And that, that comes with that uh, prayer that we would do to God, and that's fasting. Mm -hmm. So uh, we continued that conversation. I thought it'd be good to wrap up today, tonight with you doing that. Yeah, and some people have asked me about last Lord's Day when I mentioned that there's going to be initiative on prayer. And if you don't mind, Bruce, this will give me a chance to sure. kind of um, maybe whet the appetite. Uh, there are a number of things that are being done 
given what's going on in our nation that are calling for national concerted action and we're certainly praying through how to participate in that and what to participate mm -hmm. in and how to communicate those but I think there's something I think I, I'm all for the big symbolic meeting but what I really think needs to happen is the lifestyle activity mm -hmm. and, um, and, and related to that sackcloth and ashes as you've just said while Sackcloth and Ashes was a first century mannerism to depict the depth of your grief and your lament because of either your sin or the sins of a people or the consequences of those sins. Uh, there is something that is attached to our prayer life that transcends culture. It's called fasting. And that's what fasting does. Fasting is a way to communicate to yourself, to the Lord, that uh, the depth of your grief, the depth of your grief and the lament. Now, remember, we always lament with hope because our Lord is gracious and his grace is greater than our sin. But that fasting is a part of that. Fasting is a declaration of intensity. Um, a, of awareness of your sin, the intensity that you want to kill your sin, the desire that you want to clearly, without mitigation or modification, confess your sin to the Lord. And if we confess our sins, he, he who is at the right hand is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, um, so I think that's what I would say to the questioner and to ourselves. And we'd like to facilitate that. So if you'll be just praying about it, our leadership is working through how can we, not just an event, uh, we'll certainly acknowledge events, but what is it that we can do for concerted action in a season of prayer and fasting? Now notice how I said it, prayer and fasting. Uh, the Bible many times will talk about prayer without fasting. But the Bible doesn't talk about fasting without prayer. Mm. They are tied to each other. And the fasting shows up in prayer in the context of the lament of sin and its consequences. And I think we have many reasons to fast right now uh, before the Lord, not to be seen by people. Jesus condemns that. But before the Lord, we have many reasons to fast. So what I'm promising is this initiative, this season, in some form or fashion, as it is framed, will be communicated. And not only the season of concerted prayer uh, for all of us, and, um, and one that can't be affected in terms of a meeting size because of COVID restrictions and things like that, but one that can ascend 24-7 for an extended period and season of life, and that also has the opportunity to unite our grief and lament over what we see in our culture, our nation, and in our own lives, and what we see even in the professing church. Uh, prayer and fasting, and, uh, and I hope to be able to be able to share that in the future. But listen, that's be all because we got hope. Mm -hmm. We don't fast in hopelessness. We fast and pray in hope. We lament, we lament with hope. Oh, God, bring revival power to us, to our marriages, to our family, to our churches and our church and to our lives. Bring it, that revival power, to your church and through your church, and may it be manifested in a sweeping gospel movement that souls are brought into the kingdom. Oh God, raise up again those trumpet voices of the gospel in pulpits like Whitfield and Edwards and Tennant and Wesley. Raise them up again. That's what we need to be praying for. And uh, we want to move in that direction. Obviously, the symbolic and de declarative events will work our way through that. But the substantive event of prayer and fasting in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, 
in our congregational communities and in our church. We look forward to talking with you about that uh, in these coming days, um, particularly as we anticipate all of the dynamics of happening in a nation divided, pestilence, an election, all of those things that are before us. You know, Pastor, even as you say that, we've had conversations about this, and uh, it's our, it is our prayer, it's our hope, it's really our expectation that doing something would focus and it would unify, but it wouldn't, be, wouldn't necessarily be what started us praying. We're already praying, and so we want to get the people yeah. already. Don't wait on whatever the plan That's is right. through the prayer. That's right. People will already be praying, but this will give us a unified focus yeah. over a period of time on that prayer. That's a great word, Bruce. Don't, don't wait uh, for the framing and the directives mm-hmm. that come through what I've just talked about. Go ahead and start praying. Call upon the Lord with praise and petition. Mm-hmm. Do so persistently. Do so pervasively. Do so. Be li- let's be like that woman where the judge says, well, I'm going to answer because uh, you've given me a black eye. Well, and, and, and we know I can't give God a black eye, and I know God's not reluctant to answer. But if, God, if, if a judge responds to the intensity, if a reluctant ju- uh, judge responds to the intensity and passion of such a woman, what would the God who wants to bless us with his power and his presence do if we keep coming to him with persistence and with, um, as my dear friend Al says, with an intolerable burden? And praise the Lord for that. Amen. Well, please keep sending your questions to askthepastor at briarwood.org, and we'll continue to take them up. May the Lord bless you.